connected. Again, welcome everyone to the La Crosse Public Library's presentation of Shipwrecks, Great Treasures of the Great Lakes. We're so glad to have Cal Cuthrati with us this evening. He's an award-winning underwater photographer and published dive author, and he has a great presentation for you and very timely this evening as well. So we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to Cal as he's got lots to share with us this evening. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, really a pleasure to be here tonight. And we're just going to go ahead and start the screen share program. I'm going to get my splash screen up here real quick. And uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for joining in tonight. Um, I know it's a little bit cold in La Crosse and in Wisconsin, but you guys are going to have some really great weather coming up next week. I kind of peeked at the weather. Uh, the weather forecast. So anyways, it's a great way to hang out tonight. We're going to talk about some shipwrecks. As I was mentioning to Heather earlier, this is a really great program for not only the people that are very familiar with Great Lakes shipwrecks, but it also is a really good primer for those of you who may, may not know anything about Great Lakes shipwrecks. Um, this is going to sort of explain why they're there and, and why there's so many of them there. So uh, I think what we're going to do is just sort of dive right in here. So um, at any rate, again, thanks for coming in. And if you have any questions, please, I'd be more than happy to answer them after the show is done. We'll do a, a Q and A, and I'll hang around as long as it takes. All right. So in July of uh, 1679, the French explorer Robert LaSalle made history in a way that I'm sure he didn't intend. He launched a vessel that would become the first shipwreck ever on the upper Great Lakes. Now LaSalle's bark was a 45 ton wooden sailing ship named Griffin, and it was constructed at the mouth of Cayuga Creek in Western New York. And that's about three miles upriver from Niagara Falls, just to give you sort of an idea where that's at. It was one of the very first European built vessels on the lakes. And only a few months later, in mid-September, when it left Washington Island in Wisconsin's Door County on a fair summer day, it vanished forever into the pages of history. Now the vessel along with its cargo of furs, five cannons and crew of five, it was never seen or heard from again. And the Griffin is yet to be positively identified or found. And though it was the first shipwreck on the upper Great Lakes, it sure wouldn't be the last. And since then, it's estimated that maybe as many as 6,000 vessels have made their way to the bottom of the Great Lakes. Now the lakes are a collective body of water so large, they represent 21% of the Earth's fresh water. And they have many names reflective of their size, like the Big Five and the Third Coast. They're really actually more inland seas than they are lakes. They're so massive, in fact, they manufacture their own weather. And their storms can be as deadly to man and ship as anything on the world's oceans. Traveling by boat on the Great Lakes was not to be taken lightly 300 years ago and not 100 years ago, and certainly not today either. So maybe you're still pondering the number that I just gave you a minute ago, 6,000. Wow, why are there so many shipwrecks in this area? And what's causing all these ships to sink? Is it like a Bermuda Triangle? <laughs> no, not quite. In order to understand the answers to those questions, you really have to realize that in the 1800s, when the Midwest was really starting to expand, there were no interstates. There were no semi-trucks and the roads that they did have were quite poor. The fastest, easiest, cheapest way to move people and goods was by boat, period. Nearly everything moved by way of lakes and rivers. There were thousands of vessels from small schooners to large steamers, and they're all trying to get from A to B, from this port to that port, and they're all trying to do it as quickly as possible because time is money. Now throw into the pot vicious summer squalls, hurricane winds, monster waves, dense fog, 
and whiteout snowstorms. Add in an equal amount of human error, captain's misjudgment, and profit-driven corporate greed. And you stir that whole thing up vigorously, top it off with an icing of no GPS, no radar, no weather forecasting, and in the early days, not even radio. What you've got is a recipe for disaster, lives and ships lost. Whether it be ship-to-ship -ship collision, running aground, fire, sinking from disrepair and neglect, massive waves or ice, there are a lot of ways to sink a ship on the Great Lakes. And thus, over the decades, a museum of maritime history has been slowly assembled on the bottom of the lakes. Archaeological gems, each virtually frozen in time. There are few comparable examples of sites on dry land that are just so undisturbed, except for maybe tombs or caves. Now, oftentimes, divers get to see sites like this when we visit a shipwreck. We can see the everyday items that our ancestors used the coffee pot that poured that coffee, that last cup before they died, the stove that heated it, the dishes that they had last night's meal on, the tools they used, even the clothing they wore. But in order to see all these things, we need to breathe underwater. And man's been trying to do that for hundreds of years using various contraptions. And fortunately, 1943, another Frenchman by the name of Jacques Cousteau helped invent something called the demand regulator. And it was a device which significantly increased bottom times and it opened the floodgates for what would become a new sport and ultimately a multi-billion dollar industry. Now today, with advancements in equipment such as rebreathers, divers can safely go deeper and they can stay longer than ever before. And one piece of equipment that I rarely leave behind is my camera because photographing shipwrecks is really one of my passions and it's probably the main reason I still dive today. So now that we know why so many ships go to the bottom, let's take a look at some photos that really exemplify the diversity of those Great Lakes shipwrecks while at the same time showcasing their haunting beauty. We're gonna start off in Georgian Bay, which is a part of Lake Huron. And we're gonna take a look at the steamer Manasu. Now, after being laid up for the winter, the passenger steamer Manasu was pressed into service for one last run of the year to bring a hundred plus head of cattle back to the mainland from Manitoulin Island. Less than 12 hours into the trip home, the weather started kicking up, and this is going to be a recurring theme tonight, and that ship with 21 souls aboard, it began to list, and within minutes, she rolled over onto her side and then slid below the waves stern first. And as she hit bottom over 200 feet below, her captain and some crew and the owner of the cattle, that was the reason for bringing this ship out of mothballs for that one last run, were all floating in a life raft, cold, excuse me, not a raft, a lifeboat, cold and wet for two and a half days before being rescued. It's said that the winds blew them clear from the Bruce Peninsula east almost all the way to the east shore before the winds shifted around 180 degrees and blew them all the way back to nearly where they wrecked. That's why it took two and a half days for them to be rescued. Now it's suspected that the herd uh, of cattle broke loose from their pen and the shifting weight caused the vessel to uh, founder and roll and founder. Now what I'd like to take sort of special note of before we go on to the underwater photos here is some parts of this ship. If you can see my cursor, we've got a smokestack here in the center and it carried four lifeboats on top of the cabins back here. It also has this beautiful wooden decks, uh, upper decks and cabin areas. And here's the pilot house where the captain and the navigator and the helmsman would have stood. There's even a beautiful ladder going from the main deck up to the pilot house deck here. Also, there are holes on the side of the vessel that they would have used for loading uh, items into the cargo deck, which is down below here. So we're gonna take a look at some of these 
parts of the ship right now. Now this, this Manasu is just an absolutely spectacular shipwreck because of the condition it's in. Oftentimes when these vessels would sink, air pressure built up in the vessel would become too much. And as the ship went down, it would blow these wooden structures such as the pilot house or these cabins. It would blow them apart or blow them off. They'd become detached from the vessel. Uh, they weren't built as sturdy as the rest of the vessel, as, as the hull. They were made out of lighter wood, two by four type construction, things of that nature. So to find a shipwreck in the Great Lakes with these different parts, these cabins and the pilot house and so forth still there is not that common. And so in this case, of course, we still see the that beautiful ladder with those rails there and the wood decks and the, the pilot house. It's just, it's, it's a spectacular thing. And if you look right here through the windows of that pilot house, you can sort of see the ship's wheel inside there. And it is a beautiful wheel indeed. Still in perfect condition. Uh, the black, I'm not sure if it's black or blue, but uh, the dark paint, the red paint, still even visible. It's just incredible. Now we're looking right through that window that we that we saw in the last photo, and in front of the wheel, right at the at the the bottom of that window is the gimbaled compass. And what I mean by gimbaled is it it's made so that as the boat pitches and and rolls in the water, the compass always stays somewhat level. And if you notice that this compass here, right, it it it's, it's appears to have a, a tilt to it. And that's because when the vessel sank stern first, it impaled into the lake bottom. The bow is actually up off of the lake bottom. A, a diver can swim completely underneath the hull of the vessel up near the bow. And so it's on a bit of an angle. And so that compass is just showing us that. Now I want you to imagine uh, being in a storm, you're the helmsman, you're behind this wheel. It's, it's your job to keep the boat on course. And, and you're, you're wondering how much more pounding this vessel is going to take before she just comes apart. And, and you might want to look at the clock because you don't know how many minutes you have left. So you look to your left and there's the clock right on the cabin wall still after all these years. Just spectacular. These are, these are the, the beautiful things of finding deep wrecks that haven't been stripped over the years by divers. Okay, now uh the lifeboats it carried four one of the lifeboats was launched before it sank and it had it had several people in it as i said the captain some crew and the owner of the cattle that smokestack when it fell over it fell over right on top of uh number two lifeboat number three lifeboat is on the bottom of the lake back near the stern and number four lifeboat is this one here in our foreground. And the reason I took this picture is because the detail, the human touch to the story, right? Remember people often die in these shipwrecks and it's not just a story about a vessel going down, it's a story about people's lives getting torn apart. But this is what brings that home. Those are hand written markings on there. Um, L, presumably for length, B for beam, D for depth, and then there were markings on there so that they knew how many people the lifeboat could take, how long it was, how wide it was, uh, how much water it drew. So just a really, really cool feature. Now, one of the other things besides the cattle that this vessel was carrying was the one-year-old Chevy two-door coupe that was owned by the man who owned the cattle. And he was shipping it uh, along with the cattle. It's a 1927 Chevy Coupe. This vessel sank in 1928, and that car is still on the cargo deck. And my dive partner for that dive, Stephen Weimer II, amazing diver, he's, I'm photographing him photographing the car through that cargo loading hatch. Here's another shot of that car. Look closely at the bow tie emblem on the grill, it's still there, still in great condition. That's what cold water will do for wrecks in the Great Lakes. All right, that was the Manasu. We're gonna stay in Lake Huron and we're gonna move up to the very tip of the Bruce Peninsula to Tobamori, Ontario. And we're gonna take a look at the uh, Bark Arabia, which was a 31 year old 
two-mast sailing ship when it was bringing corn from Chicago to Midland, Ontario. And it got caught in a pretty fierce storm near Tobomori. Uh, the crew manned those pumps to try and keep it dry for 18 hours before finally giving up on their ship. And they launched the yawl boat, which is another word for the lifeboat. They rode to the safety of a nearby island called Echo Island, but it's also now called Horse Island. And that's in reference to the fact that several horses were aboard the Arabia. And when it foundered, those horses swam to the island. And they lived out the rest of their lives, actually, on Echo Island. Um, and so that's why they also call it Horse Island. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 1985, there was a stone memorial uh, placed on the bottom of the lake, right next to the wreck, commemorating its 100th anniversary of the loss. So this is the Arabia in all her splendor. Just a, a really cool old wooden sailing ship. And I like this photo in black and white. Sometimes some of these shots are more um, impactful, I guess would be the word, with a little higher contrast in black and white. And this vessel has got a bowsprit and a jib boom still in place. It's got the bobstay chains coming down here, which was part of the standing rigging. It still has both of its large giant woodstock anchors, which we're gonna take a little closer look at. Now, if you wanna see what this looks like in color, let's just swim underneath the bowsprit to the other side. And there she is. That's what it would have looked like to me when I took the picture. Um, what we notice here on the port side, port railing is one of her masts. And the really cool thing about the mast on this wreck is that it still has the, uh, people think of it as a crow's nest, excuse me, it's, it's technical term really is a trestle tree. And that's where the lower mast and the upper mast are joined together. And this was a place where uh, sailors who were climbing in the rigging could stand and support themselves as they were doing various things. Now, uh, swimming a little bit away from the bow. Now we're right by that mast and that trestle tree. A lot of great rigging on this shipwreck and uh, rigging, especially from wooden vessels, is a lot of fun to look at as a diver. There's uh, blocks, uh, sheave blocks, things of that nature, and lines. Now also at the bow we see the windlass, which was the apparatus, the drums that would turn, which were used primarily for things like raising and lowering the anchors. Uh, but they were also used for other rigging tasks as well. And then uh, we're going to be able to see that there's two Woodstock anchors, one on port, one on starboard rail, just where they would normally be. And here's a closer look at those just enormous anchors still hanging right where they were stored when they were sailing. Moving a little bit ways back now. Um, we're still looking forward towards the bow of the vessel. The mast is sort of laying out in front of us here. Now this large box in the foreground that's lit up really nicely is actually called a centerboard trunk. And a lot of these old sailing ships had a swing keel or a centerboard that they could raise and lower. And that would allow the vessel to get into a shallower port so that they wouldn't ground out and they could uh, get into places where maybe a larger vessel couldn't or where they wouldn't have been able to if they didn't have that um, centerboard that could be raised and lowered. Of course, the centerboard is lowered when they're sailing to keep it from sliding sideways in the water. So that's what that is. And then there's another wonderful example of a double sheaved block right there. Cool details uh, for us divers. Now we are all the way at the stern of the vessel. We're about 110 or 120 feet under the surface of the lake here. And this is the helm or the wheel which has fallen away. The, the starboard uh, deck has fallen away that, um, at the stern and is sort of leaning on, a, on an angle now on the bottom of the lake. And my dive partner, Steve Weimer, is lighting up that wheel. And here's that stone memorial that we were talking about earlier that was placed in 1985. So that's the Arabia. We're going to leave Lake Huron and we're going to go up to the big lake they call Gitchagumi, uh, Lake Superior. 
we're going to go to the southwest end of Isle Royale, which is actually a national park. It belongs to the state of Michigan, believe it or not. And um, we're going to take a look at the prop Henry Chisholm, which had just left Duluth on her way to Buffalo, New York, when it ran into a storm. See, there's that whole storm thing again. It's a repeating pattern. The Chisholm actually weathered the storm okay, but it had to cut loose her consort that, uh, that she was pulling behind her during the ordeal. And after the storm passed, the Chisholm spent the next couple of days actually sort of motoring around looking for the 220 foot vessel she had been towing before casting it loose. And while attempting to make harbor, she herself ran aground on a reef near Rock of Ages Lighthouse. Now, much of the vessel actually was salvaged while it was on the reef before its remains were broke up by yet another storm only a week later. The large double expansion steam engine that propelled this vessel wound up hitting the bottom at about 140 feet of water. And this vessel was carrying 92,000 bushels of barley when she went down. And the Chisholm was not surprisingly frequently uh, well known for setting cargo capacity records during her 18 year career. So at the very stern, this is sort of a side view uh, with the, the, the prop shaft and the keel and the stern post here. This is the prop. Now, this is what happens when steel props meet rock reefs. Uh, the reef inevitably always wins. If you can notice, this blade here is actually missing part of its uh, part of its blade, and this entire blade is gone. So, um, my and you can see how big this prop is a very large propeller, as demonstrated by my dive buddy Scott Russ. Now, the steam engine that we were talking about earlier, it's it sits probably almost 30 feet high. I mean, it's it's three stories tall, it's just a, a massive piece of, of steel and iron machinery and it's sitting on the bottom of the lake. And this is the very bottom of that, that steeple engine and the drivetrain and the working parts that would have um, transferred power to the drive shaft and eventually to the prop as well. Now we've pulled back a ways a little bit. We can get a better view of how tall that really is. The lake bottom is way down here. And you can see how intricate the workings are of this piece of machinery. But what's really cool about this, we'll take a close up look, <clears throat> is that um, you can see these fine details in the ironwork uh, and in the, the castings. And this is not structural, it's not mechanical, it's, it's simply decorative. And, and this really harkens back to a time when people cared about the things that they made and it wasn't always about the bottom line. And, and just, you know, these little details in there as proof of that. Now, the reason why we're able to see this so well and all the rusticles and everything is because Lake Superior is the last of the five Great Lakes to yet be inundated with the invasive quagga uh, zebra and then eventually quagga mussels, which literally blanket and cover everything in some, some of the other, most of the other photos we're gonna look at tonight. Um, and so uh, when you're diving on shipwrecks in Lake Superior as a diver or a photographer, it's, it's just beautiful because you get to actually see what you're looking at. Uh, you can tell that it's a tool or a bowl or a this or that because it's not covered in three inches of, of layers and layers of quagga mussels. And so that's one of the really nice things about Lake Superior. Although in my estimation, the visibility of the water in Lake Superior is not as good as it is in Michigan or Huron. And that's the flip side of the quagga mussel coin. And one last parting shot of that 30 foot tall uh, double expansion, or yeah, the double expansion steeple steam engine that powered that vessel. Um, this is actually a four image mosaic. And what that means is I had to get closer to the, the engine and because the water clarity just wasn't good enough for me to get the entire thing all in one frame in one photo snap. Took uh, four images 
and stacked them on top and manually blended them together in Photoshop in order to create that one sort of impossible four image mosaic. All right, so we're gonna stay in Lake Superior. And we're gonna take a look at a really big steel freighter on the other side of Isle Royale called the Chester Congdon. Now the Congdon, uh, after being on the lake for 11 years, ran aground while fogged in at Canoe Rocks. And she was carrying, I think, 380,000 bushels of wheat. That's how big this freighter was from Thunder Bay, Ontario. Two days after she grounded on the reef, a storm came along and tore her in two, and she sank. And many of the ship's furnishings had been salvaged during those two days when she was stuck on the reef before she got tore up. Uh, but the wreck was also the first on Lake Superior to be valued at over a million dollars, which is uh, quite interesting. Now I've prepared a little animation here, which sort of shows what the storm did to it two days after it wrecked. Basically tore the head off the ship. The head somehow managed to turn around, slide down one side of the reef while the rest of the vessel slid down the other. So it's actually two separate dives now, one on either side of the reef. And I did not dive the stern section. I did dive, however, the bow section. So it's sitting on an angle looking up at the surface, kind of looking for the rest of its body. That's how I sort of envision it. But this is the angle that she's looking up. And this is really a fun dive too, because there's a lot of penetration capability uh, for trained divers to get inside some of these lower cabins or to go in the pilot house. So uh, fun dive. Here's another look at some of the wreckage that was associated with that on the bottom of the lake next to the bow of the vessel. Kind of an eerie, eerie shot. All right, one last shipwreck in Lake Superior. And this one is on the shores of Michigan's Upper Peninsula at Munising. And the wreck is called the Bermuda. And she was reportedly uh, had two feet of water in her bilge when she took on her load of iron ore at Marquette, Michigan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pounding waves from a storm and now a badly leaking hull forced the captain to sh seek shelter in Munising Bay, where in the middle of the night, unfortunately, she sank, sadly taking three of her crewmen with her. Now, 13 years after she sank, she was floated and she was towed to very nearby Murray Bay uh, for, by a salvage crew. And it's there at Murray Bay where her lifting chains once again slipped and the vessel settled on the bottom again. Now she was only in 25 feet of water, but she was in a protected bay uh, where she's safe from ravages of storms and, and ice flows and things of that nature. Now she was 10 years old when she sank the first time. So as I said before, it's really shallow. It's only 25 or 30 feet deep here. And this is being demonstrated by my friend Reason Pilot, who is doing a little free dive practice on the wreck while I was uh, doing regular scuba and taking photographs. You can see the surface right up here, very close. And the sunlight is, is easily penetrating down to the decks, which is really cool. And this is one of my favorite photos of the wreck, simply because it almost looks like I photoshopped it to look like it's coming out of the mist, but I didn't. This is actually what it looked like. The water was very uh, turbid at that point. It had a lot of particulate matter suspended in the water column. Uh, and the reason why is because <clears throat> this vessel is, during the summer months, visited quite often by tourist glass bottom boats who like to get over the top of the wreck and so that the people can peer through the bottom down at the wreck. But in order to position themselves and move along the wreck, they have a lot of prop wash, which stirs up a lot of the sand because the bottom is so close to the surface. <clears throat> and so you end up getting this kind of like cloudy appearance due to all the sand and silt in the water. And it takes a while for that to settle out or to move through if there's no current. Uh, we were waiting for the 
tour boat that was there prior to us to finish with its tour before we could come along and anchor up and then dive on it. Uh, so that when we got there and got in the water, this is this is sort of what we had, but you can see those light rays of sunlight coming down, uh, made for a really pretty picture. Getting back to that whole thing about no quagga mussels in Lake Superior to speak of, and, and you really get to see the joints in the wood and, and the craftsmanship and how the pieces fit together, you know, like this bow shot of the, of the Bermuda. So um, really the nice part about diving in Superior. Picture on the left is taken from inside the cargo hold, looking up through some of the open cargo hatches and missing deck boards. And there are still pieces of uh, her cargo on the bottom inside the hold. And then the picture on the right is the cut water, the leading edge of the bow, which I just found to be uh, kind of interesting. And I like the pattern of the wood here. Also, I think part of her bow sprit or, or at least something is laying on the, the bottom there in front of her. The parting shot here for the Bermuda is the stern shot. And I have to chuckle every time I look at this photo. The reason I took it, it was twofold really. The, the rudder on this sailing ship is so massive. Look at, Reason's a big guy, okay? Reason's like 6'4", probably, I don't know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be really nice and say over 200 pounds, but, but he's got a big hand. He's got a man's hand. And, and you can see how small it looks next to the thickness of this wood rudder. I mean, that rudder is probably six inches thick. Just a massive, um, large slab of wood. And, and Reason's still free diving here. And then my dive buddy, Steven Weimer, is in technical gear that's you know good to 250 feet. And we're, we're doing a 25 foot dive. Um, so it was just kind of funny. High tech, no tech. That's, that's why I like that shot. All right, guys, we're gonna come into uh, Lake Michigan, my home lake for so many years, having lived in Milwaukee, um, pretty much or Milwaukee area my entire life. We're gonna start with the uh, Frank O'Connor, which was uh, built in 1892 as one of three sisters. And at 301 feet long, the vessel was really pushing the limits of wooden boat building with an assist of iron straps called hogging. Now, these three sisters were uh, among the largest wooden built vessels on the Great Lakes, actually. The 26-year-old Frank O'Connor was carrying 3,000 tons of coal from Buffalo, bringing it to Milwaukee when she caught fire up in the bow. Now the cause of the fire to this day is still unknown, but the ship had been carrying grain all season and the dust left behind was no doubt like tinder. If, if you have any familiarity with farms, you know that uh, grain dust is, is highly flammable. The vessel was 10 miles offshore when the fire started and hoping to run her aground, the captain steered for shore and came within two miles when the steering gear actually burned through. So that's when they no longer had control of the vessel. And the captain at that point um, and crew abandoned ship and they took to the lifeboats. Now the Cana Island lighthouse keeper assisted the crew by towing their lifeboats away from this massive fire, this burning wreck with his power boat. The vessel was actually seen burning well into the night um, and it did end up burning right to the waterline before it sank. Now she was powered by a massive triple expansion steam engine, similar to the one that we looked at from the Chisholm. And that steam engine had the power to turn the huge 12 foot diameter prop on the Frank O'Connor at an RPM of 85 revolutions per minute, which is actually really pretty impressive. So like I said before, she burned to the waterline so that there is uh, not a whole lot of structure down below. Now this is a relatively shallow dive and we are looking at the stern in that 12 foot diameter propeller. Now you can see my dive buddy shining his light on it. And let's just take sort of a different look at that from directly behind. We can see the full size of that prop. And here's the stern post. Now this large slab of wood in the foreground of the photograph is actually the rudder which has fallen away and is now laying on the, on the bottom of the lake. <clears throat> I'd like to mention also that the color of the water in these photos, this emerald green is not artificial. That's exactly what it looked like that day. Um, there was a, an incredible algae bloom happening the day that we dove this wreck. And that's what accounted for that. So that's why the green pictures. And that's kind of the neat thing about diving in the Great Lakes. The water can be anything from Caribbean blue to 
pitch black at times to, to emerald green. It can be all sorts of different things. Anyways, here's a, a distance shot. We had fairly good vis, even though it was green water, of that just massive ex uh, triple expansion steam engine. I don't know if I said it before or not, but it's a pretty shallow dive. It's only about 60 feet deep. So that's why it's so light up here at the surface, kind of cameras sort of looking up a little bit. And then off to the left, we see her two, uh, her two scotch boilers, which powered, uh, created the, uh, the steam that that engine ran on. So cool wreck. Now, if you make the long swim, which I said, this was a 301 foot long vessel. So if you make the football field distance swim up to the bow, there's not a whole lot, but there is a really nice anchor up there yet. And that's what uh, Steve is lighting up here in this photo. So there's a, a, an anchor and a pretty large pile of anchor chain. And there's of course, um, some things along the way, uh, various pieces of machinery and so forth uh, and parts of the wreck to keep you occupied during that swim. <clears throat> All right. This is one of my favorite parts of the show. This is the Rouse Simmons. You might have heard of it called the, uh, the Christmas tree ship. In, in my estimation, this is the most famous shipwreck in Lake Michigan, the Christmas tree ship. At any rate, the Rouse Simmons was famous for bringing Christmas trees to Chicago from Michigan's Upper Peninsula at the end of each shipping season. And her captain, Captain Scheunemann, he'd sell those trees directly from the deck of the schooner cheaper than anyone else in Chicago because there was no middleman. People were allowed to come right up to the dock, right up to the boat and get their Christmas trees. And it, they became a beloved uh, tradition, certainly in Chicago. Now the vessel had left Thompson Harbor, Michigan with over 5,000 trees aboard, which is somewhat overloaded uh, according to various sources of the day. And on the 23rd of November, so just a few days before Thanksgiving in 1912, um, and keep in mind, this is 1912, right? So same year the Titanic sank. So this is, this is, <laughs> that's, you know, that's a long time ago. Uh, that, that was 23rd November, 1912. Um, and prior to her sinking, two crew and the yawl boat uh, were washed overboard by a large wave. And the vessel actually tried valiantly to reach a safe harbor and we, we know all of this because it was written down in a, a literal message in a bottle that was found after the ordeal. Uh, but she would not be seen again until 1971 when um, famed Bayview, Wisconsin resident and shipwreck hunter Kent Bell Richard actually located the wreck. Now the Rouse Simmons I only ever dove it once. It's a little difficult to get to if, if, uh, if you live in Milwaukee. It's you got to drive a bunch of hours and there's not a lot of uh, choices for running if you don't have your own boat out to the wreck. But the reason I think that I really only dove it once is because um, we had the best visibility or clearest water, if you want to think of it that way, of any dive that I had ever had up to that point or since. I've never ever seen water in the Great Lakes as clear as I did on this dive. And this was kind of my view as I was coming down the, uh, the mooring line to the wreck. This was a 124 foot long sailing ship, a very, very large vessel. And, and you could see it all. I mean, the, the clarity uh, was just absolutely outstanding. Now the wreck itself, is not by any means the most intact ship I've ever dove on. Um, in fact, she's kind of beat up a little bit. If you notice, all the deck boards are gone. They're all missing, but that's okay. I, the Rouse Simmons, it, it's, it's the Christmas tree ship. Everybody, if you're a wreck diver, you got to dive it at least once. And I had happened to hit it on a day when we had um, just mind staggering visibility. Now this is a shot at the very bow. Here's that windlass. That was a common piece of equipment on these vessels and a Samson post here. And these are called cat heads. That's where they would tie the anchors up when they were actually underway. Now, one of the anchors to this vessel, if you ever wanna see it, it's, it's on dry land and it's right in front of the Milwaukee Yacht Club. So if you're ever in Milwaukee and you, you're on the lakefront, uh, Go ahead and, and take a look. It's right there. You can walk right into the grounds and see it. 
Here's another shot of that windlass, and you could also see some of its cargo of Christmas tree trunks still in the cargo hold after all those years. Look at that visibility. So when she when she sank, she hit the she hit the bottom of the lake with some force, considerable force. She was moving down quickly, and she struck bow first. And all three of her wood masts snapped off and fell forward. And so that's what we're looking at right here is some of the masts and associated rigging on the lake bottom. Uh, this photo, just a little anecdote uh, as, a, as an underwater photographer, I was diving this wreck on air. It's about 165 or 170 feet deep here. And to dive that on air is, is certainly doable, but you do suffer uh, from something called narcosis, nitrogen narcosis, or rapture of the deep. And uh, if you don't know anything about diving, it's, it's uh, sort of akin to being drunk. And it makes you think weird things and do stupid stuff you wouldn't normally do and not always be completely in the moment or, or super observant, which is how it affects me as a diver. I'm not a very observant narked diver. And I was very close to one of those trestle trees, which are not common. And the trestle trees just a little bit behind us in the photo but I was so narked that I didn't have the presence of mind to just back up another six feet so I could get it in the frame when I took the shot. Um, so that's how I knew after looking at the photographs the next day when I got home and got on the computer that I was pretty well narked at 170 feet. At any rate, this is my favorite shot of it. One of my favorite all-time photos of any, any shipwreck photo I've ever taken, and I have taken thousands and thousands of them. 140 feet of visibility in Lake Michigan. It's a 124 foot wreck and I'm 15 feet out in front of it and I can see the transom. Never seen anything like it since, like I said before. It's the clearest water I've ever seen in the Great Lakes. Even Cozumel, Mexico, the water's not that clear. You typically only get about 80 feet in Cozumel. So an absolutely spectacular, special, wonderful day. And that's why I, I never felt a need to ever go back uh, to, to dive this wreck again simply based on the fact that as an underwater photographer, I wasn't ever going to get uh, shots like this again. So what was the point? <laughs> Anyways, that's the Ross Simmons. And then we can see one of those centerboard trunks. It, I believe they have two on this vessel. Uh, and there's one of them right here as well. Anchor chain coming out of the hoss hole here. Okay. Now, uh, I was talking with Heather our host at the beginning of this program about one of my favorite wrecks. This one's right out of Milwaukee. It's called the Prince Willem V. It was a Dutch freighter and it is a modern day wreck, sank in 1954. <clears throat> it was a 258 foot long steel freighter from the Netherlands. Uh, it's actually collided with an oil barge which was being towed behind a tugboat in, in the evening. Now, her functional radar was turned off. And the captain of uh, the Prince Willem was actually off the bridge when she cleared Milwaukee's Harbor on her return leg back to Europe. And at just five years old, this was only her 25th trip to the region. And after striking the barge, she went to the bottom in just 90 minutes. Now, she had actually been sunk once before, however, during construction by the retreating German army during World War II. It's just a fascinating history. It's like a Hollywood movie, the shipwreck. Um, you, you can't make this stuff up. Now, all 29 souls aboard were saved when she sank here in Milwaukee. A uh, little bit of a trivia here. She was rescued by the Coast Guard cutter Hollyhock, but the wreck unfortunately has since claimed the lives of four divers. Now, um, the reason why uh, this is one of my favorite wrecks, and we're going to see this soon, is because, as I said before, it's a steel vessel. It's a modern day shipwreck uh, in the 50s. There's still people alive that remember when it happened. It's in pretty good shape. There's a lot of penetration opportunities on this wreck. It's not too deep. It's about 85, 90 feet deep. So it's not too deep. It's not too shallow. You can spend a lot of time on it, a lot of things to look at. And as I said before, has just this tremendous history. Um, it was actually in production. It was being built 
when World War II broke uh, out in Germany, um, captured the Netherlands, and they, of course, captured this vessel. They were going to try and turn it into a, a sub tender, like a mothership for mini subs. <clears throat> but the conscripted labor force kept dragging their feet. So they couldn't get it built. And then by the time the allies, allied forces were liberating um, the Netherlands, the Germans were on the retreat. Retreat. They dynamited it to blockade uh, their uh, one of the waterways to aid in their retreat. So that's why it was sunk once before. And it was raised a few years after the war and um, refitted and, and then finished and then put into service with the expressed um, purpose of going back and forth between trade in the Midwest of Canada and, the, and uh, Northwest, uh, or excuse me, North America's Midwest and Canada region and Europe. All right, let's take a look at that. So, and one of my favorite things about this is that it was also the subject of my very first ever magazine cover many, many years ago. So this is the vessel she lays on her right side, uh, almost all the way over on her right side. And it's just coming straight at you. The camera is actually, you know, we're standing up straight, we're vertical. Um, and we had pretty good visibility on the day I shot this, about 80 feet. You can see the forward loading mast here in the distance. So uh, these are those, it's a pretty good view of those quagga muscles that we were talking about earlier, just encrusting everything. Another shot of the bow with the windlass here in front and that loading mast. It has two loading masts, uh, one in, one in the, the forward portion of the vessel, one in the aft portion. Now this is the hull coming down here. And one of the things you can see in this picture right where my cursor is, is sort of a six or seven foot deep clay trench. And that's carved out of the bottom of the lake as the water currents go around the vessel and they continue to carve out the clay bottom that it's sitting in and it continues to work its way deeper and deeper into the lake as the years go by. This is another uh, shot that really exemplifies the angle on which it's laying over. My friend Dirk Wilhelm is shining his light on the pilot house. This is where the captain and the helmsman would have been standing um, when they hit, well, captain wasn't standing there when they hit the barge. Maybe that was part of the problem. This is also the smokestack in the background here. Now we're just aft of the smokestack. The smokestack is kind of out on our right here. And Dirk's shining his light, and we're looking through the six window skylight that was directly above the engine in the engine room, which is several decks down. This would have allowed natural light down into there, and I would have suspect that they would also have been able to, in times of repair, crane large parts in and out through that skylight as, as well. <clears throat> now, if you actually manage to crawl through here, which can be done, and I've done it, it's tough in doubles, but in single tank, you can do it. Uh, if you go through here and as you're swimming sideways in real life, you're actually moving down decks in the ship and you're getting closer to the top of the engine. Uh, actually did manage to do that one day on a different dive with my dive buddy, Brian Bockholt. And uh, this was a planned photo shoot to capture this right here, which is the top of the five cylinders of that large stork five cylinder diesel engine, which powered this, this vessel. And um, the, the plan was for both of us to carefully go in there and Brian was going to model and, and shine his light just like he's doing a great job and I was going to get the photos. Well, problem is, is crawling through here, there's a lot of debris that's fallen down over the years and there's a lot of silt in there and no matter how careful you are, you end up kicking up some silt. <clears throat> and I, uh, I had dragged a cloud of silt along behind me and about two seconds after I snapped this photo, he and I were both enveloped in, a, in just a big cloud of silt. And so the photo shoot was uh, over at that point. It was just a matter of um, getting out of there and continuing our dive. But I managed to get one nice shot out of that anyways. This is inside the hold, one of the cargo holds, uh, looking out through the large opening. She had a 20 foot by 20 foot opening, four of them actually, over her four cargo holds. And these are remnants of the cargo. She was carrying a lot of 55 gallon drums full of various animal byproducts and tin residue and other uh, manufacturing byproducts and so forth. And so we're just sort of inside the cargo hold and we're looking out into the open lake at this 
point here. So this is the photo that I'm probably most proud of in my entire career. It is 55 individual still photos hand stitched together in Photoshop to create one impossible image of the entire vessel. Nobody else has ever done this. Uh, it's the only image in existence of the entire 258 foot long freighter sitting on its side. Um, and it, 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 was, uh, it was a lot of work to do it, but it, it turned out really great. And um, <clears throat> it's kind of my specialty. I love doing these, these multi-image mosaics, but you can see divers. There's diver up by the bow here. There's a couple divers entering one of those cargo holds. Here's another diver and you can see their bubbles going up towards the surface. Here's a diver down here. And those two loading masts, crane masts, um, sticking up toward, coming towards us from the vessel. This is the smokestack, uh, bow of the vessel here, cargo bay one, two, three, and four, and then the stern. So it gives you a really good idea of how she's sitting on the bottom of the lake. We are gonna talk about the St. Albans next, which was a small wooden steamer, and it reg regularly ferried people and uh, package goods back and forth between Wisconsin and Michigan across the lake. It's about 80 miles at that point. And it, ran, it rammed a cake of ice, uh, a pack of ice while it was bound for Ludington in January of 1881. So this is a pretty old wreck. We're going back in time again right after they left Milwaukee. So they turned around because they were much closer to Milwaukee than the other side of the lake. And they tried to make it back to port, but the hole was just too big. And the bottom line is she filled up with water and sank 15 miles offshore. Now, all 27 people aboard survived the ordeal and they got in their lifeboats and they rowed to shore uh, 15 miles. Unfortunately, a cow, and her calf did perish in the sinking when they were unable to launch their own lifeboat due to having hooves and not thumbs. <laughs> Anyways, the St. Albans looks like this today. A little broke up. This is the bow section, which is kind of broken away from the rest of the vessel, which is receding into the lake, into the distance behind us. <clears throat> but it's still a spectacular dive. It's about 165 feet deep. Um, one of the things about this dive that is different from a lot of the other wrecks we looked at tonight is the debris field around the wreck. It's just an, an, an enormous and extensive scattering of um, ship parts that hit the bottom. Here's the, the, um, the mast. It, 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 even though it was a propeller and it was a steam-driven vessel, it, it, back in those days, they still were not completely dependent upon the steam. They hadn't gotten it into their heads that this was a dependable propulsion method. And so a lot of these vessels still had at least one mass that they could put a sail up and in a time of an emergency to maybe keep it in pointing into the into the waves as best it could, this or that. But that's the mast. Um, Steve's swimming up the port side and he's uh, shining his light. Now we're at the opposite end of the vessel and we're at the stern looking forward, which is in much better condition. We have a capstan here at the very stern. <clears throat> Here's a smokestack on the bottom of the lake in front of Steve. Again, just look at that debris, which is all over the place. And here's um, the engine sticking up from above the, the deck. Now, one really cool thing is this, where my cursor is pointing, this little dot in the distance. Well, that's Steve's camera. Now, uh, Steve is an accomplished underwater photographer in his own right. And when we dove together, we almost always both had our camera. And over the years, he became a really, really good dive model as well, which is something I never quite got the hang of. I, I was okay taking the picture, but not so good being in the picture. I didn't know where to be and what the guy wanted from me, but he was really good at it. And I got to have him as a dedicated dive model that day. Because his camera, when he got down the line, he went to turn it on and it wouldn't come on. His battery was dead. So he just left it on the deck so he wouldn't have to push it around underwater for the whole dive and he'd grab it on the way back. So um, I was very lucky that that happened. And I'm sure he's quite upset because we had really good visibility on this day. 
So two pictures juxtaposed, juxtaposed uh, uh, for one another, the bow and the stern, um, my two favorite shots of this dive. The, the bow shot is, um, this is where Steve's camera is right here in this picture. And then of course the stern shot, he's lighting up the prop and the rudders turned a little bit to starboard. So really good visibility and, and very fortunate to get those shots. Okay, last one, and then we're and then we're done. Um, the Milwaukee Car Ferry is a pretty cool wreck. It's off of Fox Point, uh, just a little bit north of Milwaukee, and it's in uh, 120 feet of water. So it was lost on October 22nd, 1929. That was just one week before the financial tempest that, of course, ushered the nation into the Great Depression. A storm of a different kind sent the car ferry Milwaukee, however, to the bottom of the lake while she was attempting to make Grand Haven, Michigan. Now she had last been seen by the Harbor's Lighthouse ship, pitching and rolling badly in heavy seas soon after leaving Milwaukee's Harbor. And like so many other sea tales, they too turned around and they tried to make it back to port, but they also foundered, presumably uh, from a badly bent sea gate, which will explain and talk about in a second, and flooding of the lower decks due to that bent seagate. All hands aboard were lost, unfortunately. It's estimated at 46 lives lost during this wreck. Uh, a lifeboat showed up, <clears throat> excuse me, on the other side of the lake in Michigan, actually, with uh, several would-be survivors' frozen bodies in it. They just, they succumbed to the freezing weather. Um, that lifeboat, if you would like to see it and touch it in person, you can go view it by visiting the lighthouse in Port Washington, Wisconsin. It's out on the front lawn in front of the lighthouse. So here's a good shot of it. Now, when I say rail car or car ferry, it was rail cars, railroad cars, not automobiles. Um, the whole thing about the railroads, Lake Michigan causes a problem for them because they have to go down and around the bottom of Lake Michigan. And Chicago was just such an enormous city, even in the 1800s and early 1900s, it was already just enormous, that rail cars would get sort of hung up in that whole um, junction there in Chicago. And it would take much longer for them to get from A to B because they would have to get uh, processed through the Chicago rail yards. And it was cheaper and it was much faster to put them on the back of one of these ferries. There were many ferries like the Car Ferry in Milwaukee. Uh, they looked just like it. And, and that was their job. They had, they had railroad rails uh, inside the vessel and they could load them up with, um, in this case, we had 25 cars, I believe, on the vessel when it sank. And it was a quick way of getting them from the east to the west across the lake and not having to go through Chicago. This is the vessel coming straight at you, sitting up proud on the bottom of the, of the lake. Um, Dirk, Wilhel Dirk Wilhelm in the front and Mike Crone in the, <clears throat> in the distance there, swimming across it. This is the metal mast. It wasn't for sailing purposes, it was for equipment laying on the bottom. And this large hole here is the hoss hole. There's one on each side where the anchor chain would have gone through and they would have Hold the anchor up tight. Now we are all the way at the stern of the vessel looking forward. It's, it's sailing away from us in this shot. There's a couple things that you can see in this shot. These are the, the rails that the train cars would have rolled onto its deck from. And this is that bent sea gate that we were talking about. It was basically a big metal door that would come down that was supposed to cover the, the back rail deck. And it's suspected that a very large bad wave uh, struck and bent it to the point where it was no longer sealing and keeping water out and subsequent waves. And because of the storm, the water kept coming in and it was able to roll along the deck. And there were vents and grates in the deck that led to rooms down below. And those rooms eventually became flooded. And that was kind of what caused her demise. Now, one of the really, really cool things that I love, every time I dove this wreck, I always made a point of, of going here if I could, which was the starboard prop shaft. It was actually a twin screw vessel, one on port, one on starboard. This is the starboard side 
we're looking aft here. And what's underneath that prop, prop shaft is actually a railroad truck, a wheel set. And if you know anything about train cars, the cars basically just sit on top of the wheels. They're not fastened to them. So if you pick, take a crane and you pick the box car up, the wheels will still set on the rails. Well, what happened was, obviously, one of those cars came off the back of the wreck at some point. Uh, as it was either on the surface or on its way down. And those wheel sets would have rolled off the back and sunk to the bottom of the lake like a paperweight, like a stone, uh, immediately, just solid iron going straight down. And the wreck just happened to settle right on top of it, which is really crazy. But again, large, I think those are also 12 foot diameter props or, or close to it. And Brian Bockholt is uh, demonstrating that by posing next to it. Uh, another one of my favorite shots of this wreck because um, it was featured in Scuba Dive Magazine many years ago as a full page image. Um, it's coming straight at us and Brian is demonstrating just how large that vessel is. It was a steel hulled vessel. It was 300, I believe 330 feet long, 331 feet long. And uh, he's shining his light on the starboard hoss hole. So really, really a cool shot. And then again, blankets of zebra mussels on the bottom, or excuse me, uh, they used to be zebras, and then they were taken over by the quaggas, which were a slightly larger cousin to the zebra. I, I believe that it's almost 100% almost quagga mussels in the lake now, but blankets, carpets of these quagga mussels on the bottom of the lake. And that's one of the reason that, uh, reasons I was able to get such good pictures all these years is because they clear that water up. Now, we talked way back in the beginning when we talked about the Manasu wooden structures blowing off when a ship sinks due to built up air pressure. This right here is a prime example of it. This is the pilot house and the chart house for the car ferry Milwaukee. Wooden structure on top of a steel hulled vessel. When it went down, that wooden structure separated from the rest of the vessel. This no doubt floated for a little while before sinking and it ended up landing about 80 feet away from the rest of the vessel. It's off to the off the port bow about 80 feet away and uh, and it settled on the bottom of the lake and you can still see there's a door, a pilot house door on each side and in yellow paint to this day, you can still see the words Milwaukee painted above it, which is really cool. And this was a, a photo shoot that my buddy Cameron Wilson and I were doing with off camera lighting that we were we had placed inside the pilot house. Uh, it was sort of a dark dive that day, and so it worked out really great. Gave it that eerie kind of ghost-like feel to it. But at any rate, that's what I have for you. Those are my 10 wrecks from the Upper Lakes. If you'd like to see more, my website is calsworld.net, and I have a lot of uh, shipwreck photography there as well as shipwreck artwork uh, that I, I have done over the years. And um, this is just a... a a, a map view of all the shipwrecks in the Great Lakes that I have photographed and dove on over the years. Um, and they're, they're labeled with their names and, and their locations. Some are out in the middle of the lake, like in Lake Erie here. And uh, so it, it's, been a, it's been a pretty good career up to this point. Anyways, um, that's what I have for you. I'm gonna stop screen sharing now and we will, um, go into Q&A. So any of those questions that you might have, uh, I would love to answer. Let me just get back to Zoom here. Here we go. All right, great. Please feel free if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask Cal a question, or if you prefer to pop a question in the chat feature, we can read that off for you. Uh, we did have one earlier in the chat, Cal, asking what kind of advanced prep you do before a dive and on your deeper dives, um, how much time do you spend underwater? Uh, great questions. <clears throat> the first part of that question, if, if I knew what wreck I was going to be going on, uh, like if I were on a trip, we would have, you know, the group and I would have targets that we had in mind that we wanted to get to. Um, sometimes you could get to them, sometimes you wouldn't always, always it didn't you know, the weather would sometimes play a factor in that. But I mean, if, if we knew what ships that we, wrecks we wanted to get to, we would do some research uh, prior 
to getting there. And, and we would try and have some sort of a rudimentary game plan for photo shoots in, in terms of, well, okay, the bow is the most photogenic part or the stern is the most photogenic part or, or what have you. And so we would at least go there and the first dive on a wreck is always kind of a, excuse my language, it, always a little bit of a shit show because you never quite know exactly what to expect even though you've seen pictures and you've heard about it and you've read about it until you actually get down there, you don't know. But that was that's how we planned for, for those. And, and if you ever got lucky enough to do a second or a third consecutive dive on the wreck, then you really knew what you wanted to shoot next or where the model needed to be or what he needed to shine his light on. And the other part of the question was, obviously the deeper you go, the less time you get, uh, you have more decompression obligation. Um, so on a dive like the Manasu, that's the deepest that I've ever personally dove at about 202 feet. Um, I had about 17 minutes of actual time on the bottom on the wreck and the dive was a little bit over an hour. So the rest of it was all decompression so that I could get back to the surface without getting bent. Thanks for sharing those insights. We've got another question in the chat asking, what's the water temperature range on your dives? <clears throat> um, typically in the Great Lakes, it, it, if you're at depth, it doesn't matter what, you know, if it's, if it's May or August, I mean, it could be 90 degrees on the surface and on, on the bottom, if you're, if you're going deep enough, if you're 100 feet or deeper, it's probably going to be a pretty typical 39 to 44 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, later in the year, later in the season, like mid to late summer, early fall, sometimes you can get some warm water down as deep as 80 or 100 feet, uh, 50, 60 degrees maybe. But it's not, it's not something you should ever bank on or, or hold your breath for. And if you're diving in, in late spring or real early summer, Typically, there's there's no thermal decline in the water. We call it top to bottom is the same temp. So uh, you have to plan your deep dives with your decompression accordingly. Because if you're going to be spending a lot of decompression time in the water in the late summer, you get the warmer water as you're near the surface. It'll help warm you up. But if you're diving in late April or early May, that water is going to be really cold all the way to the surface. And so you need to keep that in mind. Thank you. We had another question asking you about your camera setup on your dives. Um, for many, many, many years, and most of the photos that we looked at tonight, I used uh, um, a crop sensor digital Canon, like a Canon Rebel series camera, uh, a two-thirds sensor with a super wide angle rectilinear lens. And basically what that all means is that um, it's, it's not a fisheye lens. It's, it's a really wide angle lens at 10 millimeters, but it, um, it doesn't bend straight lines very much. A fisheye will make straight lines look like curves and, and it gives things an unnatural appearance. Whereas the rectilinear lens doesn't do that. And that's how I prefer to shoot my shipwrecks. Um, and then towards the last several years of my career, I switched to a full frame Canon DSLR. Um, I used a Canon 60 in an Eichlite housing with Eichlite strobes, and then um, also had hot lights for video as well. Oh, sorry, with a 12 inch dome port, I forgot to mention that. My, my first camera setup had a six inch dome port, which makes shooting split shots on the surface where the lens is half out of the water, half in the water, very difficult because you have a very small, you have a very small dome lens, six, six inches, but with a 12 inch dome port, it's easier. So that's, that's kind of how it evolved over the years for me. Thank you. The next question asks, how did NYC get a hold of the anchor from the Simmons? <clears throat> you know, that's a really good question. Um, I would suspect that they were, it was at, at one point probably donated, um, probably by whoever salvaged it. Um, and, and I did make a mention of this earlier in the, in the show and I kind of breezed over it. For those of you who don't know, 
it used to be legal to take things off these shipwrecks back in the 60s and 70s when skin diving and scuba diving was kind of in its infancy and wreck diving around here was first taking shape. And, and that was kind of what people did was they took portholes or they took, um, you know, parts of the ship that they thought would look good in their rec room. And in, I want to say 1980, um, forgive me if I'm wrong, I'm only a year or two off if I am wrong, 87 or 86, somewhere in there, they passed a law that basically said that it, it is now illegal to take anything from any shipwreck in the Great Lakes or anything off the bottom. You're not allowed to disturb it. And they made it... Um, quite a stiff penalty actually i mean they can they can fine you they can throw you in jail they can take your boat they can take all your gear they can do all kinds of stuff it's 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 a very very serious offense and it took a while i think for the diving community to transition from a a, a take mentality to a preservation minded mentality but um i got into the sport well after this law had been enacted so I never knew anything different and so I was just taught from day one you don't take anything and um, I, we had a motto uh, take only pictures leave only bubbles. Nice I like that. Uh, this question is kind of in that same regard asking if the wrecks are restricted for diving by anyone or are they open only to experienced divers or is there any restrictions in that regard? If you're a diver uh, then you know that there, there, there's no diver police out there that are going to come up and ask to see your certification level or you know are you allowed to go to this depth it, it's it's generally left up to the diver to understand his limitations and his training and dive accordingly and safely um but that being said obviously the deeper wrecks like uh, i think recreational dive limits are 130 feet so once you start diving below 130 feet, technically you are in actually what's called technical diving and um, decompression diving. And so you need, you need further training for that. And, um, and I think there's also another break at 60 feet. I think recreational um, open water diving start, stops at 60 feet and then below 60, you need your advanced. So it keeps going in increments like that. But um, as far as wrecks being off limits, uh, pretty much any of the wrecks in the Great Lakes, with the with a few exceptions, one being the Edmund Fitzgerald, which is at 530 feet, so it's it's basically unreachable to scuba divers. All but maybe, you know, there's probably 10 people in the world or maybe in the country that are qualified to dive to 530 feet. I don't know, but um, that that is illegal. You cannot dive that wreck because it's a grave site. But all the other ones are pretty much, um, yeah, if you can get to it, go for it. Excellent, thank you. That's all the questions we have in the chat. Does anyone else have any other questions for Cal before we sign off? Feel free to unmute or use the chat box, whichever works for you. Yeah, the only bad question is the one left unasked. And, and again, um, I'm, I'm, I don't mind talking about this. So if you have any questions about underwater photography, cameras, any particular shipwreck, whatever, um, feel free to ask. Greetings from Okinawa, Japan. Holy cow. Thank you, Mike Boring. Just sort of looking through the, through the chats here real quick. And um, wow, I think that's maybe the farthest away we've ever, I've ever had a visitor. <laughs> Anybody else questions? No, all right, well, um, gosh, thank you guys. It, you were a great audience and Heather, thank you again for having me and hosting me. It, it was so enjoyable. Um, and uh, you know, any, anybody uh, out there, like I said, if you're interested in more, just go to my website, calsworld.net. Thank you so much, Cal. We do have a link to your website in our chat, as well as a link to the La Crosse Public Library catalog. If you'd like to take a look at more reading materials and resources related to shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. So thanks again for sharing your time and expertise with us, Cal, with a wonderful presentation. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you again.